Hi everyone, meteorologist Brian Bennett. As you know, we have Tropical Storm Gordon sitting right over the massive red tide bloom that's been plaguing southwest Florida for quite some time. What impact will this tropical storm have on red tide? Let me answer those questions for you, but first I want to set a couple of things up real quick. First of all, here's a an aerial view from a drone showing the brown, murky, toxic water that is associated with the red tide that has resulted in hundreds of manatees and dolphins and sea turtles that have been killed by the neurotoxins and the lack of oxygen in the water. This bloom is so big, you can actually see it from outer space. In fact, uh, let me go ahead and mark off a couple of things here uh, using the telestration. In case you're not great with navigation, this is Clearwater Beach here. This is St. Pete Beach. Uh, we have downtown Tampa over here. Uh, Anna Maria Island, Bradenton, Sarasota, and then Venice down to Boca Grande, and the opening of the Caloosahatchee River, and Sanibel Island right there. Even if you're looking at this with your relatively small cell phone, you can still see the darker brown color here representing the higher concentrations of red tide that has taken up about 150 miles of previously pristine southwest Florida beaches. So far though, Pinellas County beaches have been very fortunate. The high concentrations have remained about five to 10 miles offshore, which means Pinellas County hasn't seen the massive fish kill or this brown murky water make it ashore quite yet. And cross my fingers, that doesn't happen. Of course, areas farther south, Holmes Beach, Lido Key, down to Venice, and Sanibel especially. You've been dealing with this for quite a long time, and I know you'd love to see your beaches back to normal, pristine condition. All right, so I wanted to quickly set up where the bloom is as of the latest image. Of course, that picture was taken yesterday morning from the GOES-16 satellite. And here's the latest from the National Hurricane Center. This update came out at 5 p.m. The center of the circulation is located basically due west of Marco Island. The storm's going to move off to the west-northwest at about 17 miles per hour. Wind sustained 50 miles per hour right now, but it's actually expected to strengthen a little bit before it makes landfall anywhere from about Mobile to New Orleans as a very weak hurricane or a very strong tropical storm. Again, moving off to the west-northwest. Here's a look at your GOES-16 satellite imagery. This is actually pretty impressive. This is a new feature we have, or a new satellite parameter. This is one minute infrared imagery. We only get information from our radars here on land every five minutes, but we're getting updates from space every single minute. And that's why this particular image looks so smooth is because of the frequent updates. But bottom line is the reds representing the high cloud tops producing some pretty hefty rainfall amounts. The center circulation, again, being right around the Sanibel Island area. Let's take a look at a couple of weather parameters. Of course, there's lots of things that potentially control how Crania brevis will bloom and how bad it will get. But I'm going to take a look at three weather parameters here and how the tropical storm may impact those. First of all, rain. You can see the state of Florida right here. This is based uh, on the outlook from the European computer model, the reds representing rainfall rates on the order of about two to four inches on average head farther north and we're looking at less rain. Well, of course, we know Lake Okeechobee is, is a kind of a big point source for a lot of these nutrients that are leading to the development of Crania brevis. Uh, of course, we have the sugarcane fields nearby. We have uh, along the watershed, we also have the uh, septic tanks. We also have the cow pastures. Well, some good news here. We're not looking at a lot of rain occurring over those locations. So we're not looking at a huge nutrient runoff into Lake Okeechobee. So I don't think we're going to see much of an impact as far as an increase in nitrogen and phosphorus due to runoff from nearby land. Now the Caloosahatchee watershed could actually see a little bit more rain. So it could actually contribute just a little bit to the nutrient population offshore uh, of this immediate location here. But for the most part, pretty good news that we're not looking at incredibly heavy rainfall over the watersheds that have the most uh, nutrient impact on the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. All right, so that's rainfall. The next one, waves. 
waves can have a big impact. For example, en envision that you have a glass of nice clean water. Well, you, you take a drop of, say, red watercolor and you drop it in there, you shake it up. Well, what's going to happen? That red watercolor is going to disperse pretty quickly. Well, with this tropical storm, we're looking at waves on the western part of the red tide bloom on the order of five to seven feet. Now, that's not huge like we can see with a hurricane, but nothing to be laughed at. Five to seven feet, that's some pretty choppy water. So we're looking at dispersion of Crinia brevis pretty likely in parts of the red tide bloom due to the choppy surf from this tropical system. The wind is the final factor, meteorological factor, that I wanted to look at here. And for the most part, the winds are blowing from the east to the west. And here's a look at the European computer model. First of all, let me slide this over for you. Uh, one sec, get on the corner there. All right, drag this over. And then let me take the European computer model to about 48 hours from now to show you uh, where the storm wind directions will be basically during the, the worst part of it. So the when the storm will be impacting the red tide bloom the most will actually be your Monday evening and Monday night. And that's when, when winds will be blowing from basically the east and the southeast. And that's what these little arrows here represent. And in case you can't see those, uh, the winds are blow blowing clockwise, or excuse me, counterclockwise around this area of low pressure which is typical for any tropical system. So the winds are blowing from the southeast to the northwest. Well, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation with the wind direction and the ocean currents. In fact, due to the Coriolis effect, or something called Ekman Fluid Dynamics, you actually get a little bit more of a northerly flow of the top ocean water layers, or the Gulf Ocean water, like the Gulf currents. Um, due to an easterly wind. So with, <laughs> I'm kind of flubbing this up here, but the bottom line I want to show you here is due to an east and southeast wind, the primarily primary ocean current on top of the, the Gulf of Mexico is going to be to the north over the next 24 hours or so. So that's not really great news as that's going to take some of the Crinia brevis dinoflagellates to the north to areas that were previously pristine. Hopefully though, with this slight northwesterly component, it will continue to keep the higher concentrations offshore of Pinellas County. But nonetheless, not great news that we're gonna see it push to the north. It could be worse though. A wind blowing from the west to the east would quickly take the high concentrations and bring that murky water to the immediate coastlines anywhere from Honeymoon Island all the way down to the Florida Keys. So it could be worse, but nonetheless, we are gonna see a little bit of migration to the north. At the same time though, we are seeing that dispersion as well. So uh, hopefully the two will end up canceling each other or even have a net positive effect. All right, so let me quickly summarize what the tropical storm influence is gonna be on this red tide. First of all, the choppy water is going to help to disperse the higher concentrations of Crania brevis a little bit. So that's some good news, that's positive. As far as negative, the north-northwest currents are gonna bring Crania brevis into some previously pristine water a little bit farther to the north. So that's a bit of a negative effect from the tropical system. What will have little effect, the rain that's occurring over land and around the Lake Okeechobee watersheds is not going to be really enough to add any great nutrients to Lake O or eventually water that's coming out into the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico via the Caloosahatchee and Channel 43 and 44. So you don't have to worry too much about that. The rain that's occurring over the land, or excuse me, over water, is not going to dilute Crania brevis very much either. The amount of rain that's going to fall compared to the amount of water that's in the Gulf of Mexico is fairly negligible. So not really much of an influence from the rainwater falling over the Gulf of Mexico. Also a little effect, the choppy water and the upwelling is actually going to reduce the Gulf temperature by about one to three degrees, but the optimal temperature for Crania brevis is between 72 and 82 degrees. So we're still square in that ideal area for the algae to develop. 
So despite the, the water temperatures decreasing a little bit, it's not really going to have much of an effect. All right, so you've seen the facts. I'll kind of leave it up to you whether you think the net effect will be positive or negative. I look forward to personally seeing this satellite image once the clouds have cleared to see if perhaps the higher concentrations have indeed dispersed and diluted a little bit. I'm hoping so, cross my fingers, that is the case. But for now, that's basically what I'm expecting to happen from this tropical storm. All right, guys, I'll show you the new and updated satellite image as soon as I get it, once the clouds move out. Till then, have a great and safe evening.